In the early days of 2009, an open source computer program named Bitcoin was launched. Bitcoin was created in the midst of a large global recession, which was not only affecting American and European markets, but was having virulent repercussions all over the globe. The mysterious creator of this program, who went by the alias of Satoshi Nakamoto, made it clear that they were hoping to create a financial system that was not controlled by financial institutions or government entities. Over the next several years, the saga of Bitcoin would begin to unfold, intersecting between the economic and technology fields, and potentially changing how we, human beings, view the idea of currency moving forward. For the first few months of its existence, Bitcoin was virtually worthless. Cryptocurrency enthusiasts would mine and stockpile Bitcoin for pennies on the dollar, in the hopes of accumulating enough to sell for a small fortune in the distant future. But almost all involved knew that any such effort would require months, if not years, of patience. When Bitcoin finally started to gain some real value, between 2011 and 2012, it was used primarily in the seedy corners of the internet. Darknet websites like the Silk Road provided a practical use for Bitcoin, but it was not until the middle of the decade, around 2015 or so, that other websites began to accept Bitcoin as a legitimate digital currency. By then, cryptocurrency exchanges and markets had been established, which exchanged real money into Bitcoin and vice versa and dozens of copycats had been quickly thrown together, hoping to seize upon the momentum of the cryptocurrency bubble. This market had also seen a countless number of scammers, schemers, and hackers, who took advantage of the anonymous nature of cryptocurrency for their own benefit. In 2018, one of the more peculiar events in crypto history began to play out, which continues to have wide-ranging ramifications well into 2019. This is the story of Quadriga. Welcome to Unresolved. I am your host, Michael Whelan. As you can probably already tell, this episode is not going to be about a grisly murder or a strange disappearance. Well, I guess in a way it is the latter, as this story does feature a prominent death and concerns the disappearance of something, but this episode is all about cryptocurrency and digital mysteries. If you would like to gain a more basic understanding of Bitcoin and the systems like it before we begin, consider checking out my episode from last year about Satoshi Nakamoto, which will explain how Bitcoin works and why it's such a big deal. Now, with that out of the way, before I continue on in the episode, I just want to take a minute to let you know how you can help support this show. You can support Unresolved by spreading the word to your friends and family who might be interested in listening. And you could also go above and beyond by heading to patreon.com slash unresolvedpod and becoming a patron. Patrons get the first crack at each new episode, and also get exclusive bonus episodes. I just recently released a mini-episode about the mysterious Starving of Saqqara statue and I am getting ready to record the second episode of my new exclusive Patreon series, Resolved. New episodes of that drop on the 15th of each month, and once again, you can only get that at patreon.com slash unresolvedpod. To learn more about the show or myself, just listen through to the end of this episode, or visit our website at unresolved.me. Now, without any further ado, let's learn more about the origins of the biggest Bitcoin mystery in recent memory. Gerald William Cotton was born on May 11, 1988. A Canadian, he grew up in Belleville, Ontario, and eventually began attending York University in the mid-2000s, not too far away from home in Toronto. There, he attended the Schulich School of Business, and worked his way towards a bachelor's degree in business administration. Post-graduation, Jerry, as he was known among family and friends, continued to live and work in the Toronto region. It was at around this time that he began to grow increasingly interested in cryptocurrency, which was beginning to take off in popularity. His first major interest was the most popular form of crypto, Bitcoin, which he began to invest in immediately, before the market really started to explode. After dipping his toes in this exciting and bold unexplored market, Jerry Cotton decided to jump in headfirst. 
His initial interest had exposed him to the underground crypto community, and soon enough, he had become a CBP, a certified Bitcoin professional, the Cryptocurrency Certification Consortium, who designates such labels, describes CBPs as, Certified Bitcoin professionals are able to apply Bitcoin technology to their professional area of expertise, and understand privacy aspects, double spending, and other issues that are related to the currency. Despite being very young and relatively inexperienced in business matters, Gerald Cotton was able to quickly understand a void in the cryptocurrency market, a void which others were trying to fill, but failing to fully address. Here he is, addressing the origins of his company to a 2015 Drink Demos panel. So I've been involved in a number of digital currencies over the years and payment processors, and when Bit came, Bitcoin came around, it was completely different than anything I'd ever seen before. Usually when you'd have an online payment processor, it'd be like PayPal, where you have a centralized ledger that's maintained by a large corporation. With Bitcoin, you basically get rid of that large corporation. So I was really, really fascinated with that technology. But one of the hardest parts about Bitcoin was acquiring the Bitcoin. When you're dealing with a company like PayPal, you just make a PayPal account and then you fund it with your, you just hook up your bank account and get money in your PayPal account. However, with Bitcoin, it was very, very hard, especially in Canada, to go about doing that. So I created Quadriga CX in 2013, and we basically are now the largest exchange in Canada for buying and selling Bitcoin. Congratulations. Thanks. By 2013, Gerald Cotton had moved from Toronto to Vancouver, British Columbia, where he would found the company Quadriga, alongside a friend of his named Michael Patron. More on him later. Quadriga was created in November of 2013, with the overarching parent company being branded as Quadriga Fintech Solutions. The main company, however, was named Quadriga CX which stood for Quadriga Cryptocurrency Exchange. This company would do exactly what its name stated, exchange money into crypto, and vice versa. The Digital Exchange, which would be Quadriga's largest platform, would launch on Boxing Day of 2013, which is December 26th. Initially, Quadriga only started as a service for those in the local market, but would quickly become one of Canada's premier cryptocurrency exchanges almost by default, really. It was just one of a handful launched over the next several years, and just so happened to outlast most of its competitors. In 2014, Quadriga would install the second Bitcoin ATM in Vancouver, and for the first couple of months at least, would exchange just a Bitcoin or two here or there. But by the end of 2014, Quadriga had four employees, with offices in Vancouver and Toronto, and had done more than $7.4 million in crypto exchanges. They seemed well poised to continue their expansion into 2015 and beyond. Here is Gerald Cotton speaking at a 2015 Decentral conference, in which he explores the exciting future possibilities for Quadriga. Thanks, Anthony. It's a pleasure to be here tonight in front of such a huge crowd that's so enthusiastic about Bitcoin and other decentralized technologies. So like Anthony was saying, my name is Gerald Cotton, and I'm the founder of Quadriga CX, which is Canada's largest Bitcoin exchange. We started in 2013, and when we began, we were a relatively small company, trading just a few Bitcoins every day. However, over the past year, we've grown to become the largest exchange in the country, and over the past 12 months, we've exchanged more than $25 million worth of Bitcoin. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Bitcoin exchanges and what we do, I like to compare it to a stock exchange. However, instead of trading stocks on our exchange, people trade Bitcoin. That's the only asset, along with Canadian dollars, that's traded on our exchange. So as a result, Quadriga CX is the primary way that a lot of Canadians purchase their first Bitcoins. And it's where they go to buy and sell Bitcoins on an ongoing basis. In addition to that, because we have the trading platform, we've also managed to create a number of auxiliary businesses, such as our merchant platform that allows any company, um, whether it be online or offline, to accept Bitcoin from their clients for their goods and services, and then have those payments transferred directly in Canadian dollars to their Canadian bank account. So this, this gets rid of the uh, currency fluctuations that everyone always thinks about when they think about Bitcoin. Um, 
The big announcement that Anthony alluded to is we have announced that Quadriga CX will be going public. Uh, I don't have the specific IPO date, but it should be sometime next month. Anyways. Anyways, I'm thrilled to be at this event. It's, um, I see it as a pivotal moment in the Bitcoin space. It's basically a new chapter as we move towards the mainstream financial industry. And it basically is the next step, I think, in the evolution of decentralized payment networks. I hope that I can continue working with everyone here on developing new and innovative payment technologies that we can integrate into our everyday lives. Thank you. Despite the outward appearance of all seeming to be well, Quadriga was beginning to struggle in 2015. As you just heard, founder and CEO Jerry Cotton was floating the idea of taking the company public, stating his intentions to take the company public by the end of the year. However, this decision had left many of the other company directors disgruntled, as they all knew that the company had been facing a cash shortage in the prior months. In fact, leading up to January of 2015, the company had earned only $22,168 in cryptocurrency commissions, but had lost close to $90,000 in upkeep and operational cost. Quadriga was bleeding cash. Looking back, many consider the public position of Gerald Cotton to be a bluff. Some believe that he never had any intention of listing the company on the Canadian Securities Exchange but instead used this positioning to raise upwards of $850,000 in capital. That would only seem to be a deferral though, as the company had blown through that capital by the summer of 2015. By June, Quadriga had run out of money again, and most, if not all, of Gerald's fellow directors and employees left the company. This included Michael Patron, who left Quadriga after getting into a dispute with Jerry over the decision to take the company public. Ironically, this decision would end up becoming a non-issue by the end of the year. By the time 2016 rolled around, Gerald Cotton had decided not to take the company public and list it on the CSE. It was possible that he did not want to publicly disclose financial statements for the company, but we can only guess at his reasons now. Through that year, Quadriga continued on as a one-man operation, with Jerry overseeing almost every facet of the company by himself. He would do almost everything through his laptop, and seemed willing to stick around, believing that the cryptocurrency market was about to blow up. He added more options to the Quadriga CX platform, allowing users to not only exchange Bitcoin for cash, and cash for Bitcoin, but added options for additional cryptocurrencies, such as Litecoin and Ethereum. Quadriga would continue handling millions of dollars worth of crypto exchanges through 2016, but 2017 was the year that Bitcoin finally blew up, and drew a bunch of added interest to the crypto market. That year, the average price of a Bitcoin jumped from around $1,000 to a peak value of more than $20,000. With it, Quadriga CX was no longer handling millions of dollars in cryptocurrency exchanges, but more than a billion dollars in exchanges. Because of their business model, they took a small percentage of each transaction in commission, and Gerald found himself an overnight millionaire. Surprisingly, this led to a number of additional issues. I guess it is true. More money, more problems. Despite revenue no longer being a problem, Quadriga did not have a real accounting system. After all, the company was essentially operated by Gerald on whatever laptop he was using at the time, and had been relying on external payment processors to handle transactions. This led to a number of cash flow problems, as it was never quite clear how much of the company was held in actual assets versus cryptocurrency, which are often kept anonymous. To make matters worse, Quadriga lost approximately $14 million worth of value due to a scripting error with the cryptocurrency Ether. Sadly, that was one of the dangers when working with cryptocurrency. Similar issues would continue to plague the company well into 2018, despite the company moving and making more money than ever. The cash flow problems continued, eventually leading to longer delays for Quadriga CX customers. Through the first half of the year, customers of the exchange reported having to wait hours, if not days, 
for cash withdrawals. That was made all the more troubling when you factor in the ensuing crash of the Bitcoin market, which would collapse by more than half of its peak 2017 value through the year, highlighting the volatility of the crypto market. When pressed for why it was taking longer and longer for customers to exchange their Bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies for actual cash, Quadriga CEO Gerald Cotton had an explanation. It was all tied into a legal battle that he had been waging against the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce since January of that year. In January of 2018, roughly $28 million that had been moved through Quadriga was frozen. This was money that had been moved through one of Quadriga's payment processors, Custodian Inc. The Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, commonly abbreviated as CIBC, had noticed money moving through these accounts into the personal account of the owner of Custodian Inc., named Jose Reyes. This issue includes some pretty complicated legal and accounting jargon, which I hardly understand, but basically, the $28 million or so from Quadriga had come from 388 different depositors. These were 388 Quadriga customers that had either transferred their money or crypto into Quadriga. The Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce had received requests from 7 out of these 388 Quadriga depositors to withdraw their money. But because of the fluid nature of these assets, there was no way for CIBC to determine who the money actually belonged to. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Anyhow, the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce had frozen the money in an attempt to figure out who the money belonged to. They were hoping to divert it back to its rightful owner, but this would require at least a brief investigation into the accounting practices of both Quadriga and its payment processor, Custodian. CIBC had made repeated attempts to get in touch with Quadriga employees or its CEO slash founder, Gerald Cotton, but could not do so. All of their calls went unreturned, and emails were bounced right back to them. After repeated failed attempts to make contact with Quadriga, CIBC asked for a Canadian court to take possession of the roughly $28 million in frozen assets and determine its rightful ownership. This came at a time when Bitcoin prices were dropping dramatically, having lost more than 60% of its value in a span of months. During such a tumultuous time, $28 million in frozen assets wasn't exactly chump change, and could have a significant impact on Quadriga's bottom line. An Ontario Superior Court took possession of the $28 million, and court proceedings kicked off shortly thereafter. In an email to the Globe and Mail publication, Quadriga CEO Gerald Cotton wrote about the impact of these frozen assets as they pertained to Quadriga customers. Quote, there are currently delays for some specific withdrawal options, particularly due to the fact that CIBC is withholding tens of millions of dollars that belong to us, that were in an account of one of our payment processors. Gerald asked for the money to be returned to him and Quadriga, and filed an illegal motion. Quote, this court should not succumb to the bank's unsubstantiated and highly offensive speculation that there must be shady dealings afoot, because Quadriga's business is a trading platform for individuals trading in cryptocurrencies. As you can imagine, this $28 million in frozen money resulted in even longer delays for Quadriga customers. What had started out as hours or day-long waits to exchange cryptocurrency for cash was now becoming weeks or months long waits, with some Quadriga customers having to wait roughly half a year to withdraw their money. Some chose to just give up and leave their money invested in cryptocurrency through Quadriga CX, having been unable to receive payouts or exchange it for cash in a timely manner. Gerald Cotton wrote numerous emails to Quadriga customers, blaming the Canadian banking system for quote-unquote conspiring against him and other cryptocurrency exchanges. In one email, he even wrote, the number of individuals in the Bitcoin community that have been shut out of the banking system is staggering. Jerry directly blamed this freeze on $28 million in assets for Quadriga's inability to pay out accounts, even though his company had handled more than $1.4 billion in crypto exchanges the year before. 
This debate with CIBC carried on until November of 2018, when Judge Glenn Haney of the Ontario Superior Court sided with the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce. Judge Haney ruled that it was unclear who actually owned the $28 million in frozen assets, and the money was handed over to the Superior Court for further investigation. This was a major setback to the business aspirations of Quadriga CEO Jerry Cotton, who publicly tried to put on a brave face. In emails to Quadriga customers, he hoped that the issue would be resolved before the winter holidays. Quote, More importantly, the court has made no ruling yet on whether CIBC acted appropriately in freezing the funds in the first place. Regarding this point, we are considering our next steps. While things were progressing unexpectedly in his professional life, in his personal life, Gerald Cotton had now married and prepared to move on to the next step of his life, his 30s. Gerald and his wife, Jennifer Robertson, had married at some point in 2018. The two had been friends for the better part of at least three years, and had been romantically involved for some time prior to their nuptials. In fact, between 2016 and 2018, the couple had invested in multiple real estate properties throughout Canada, including a home in Fall River, Nova Scotia. In addition to being the sole officer and director for Quadriga, Jerry was known as a funny, kind, and affable young man. He constantly cracked jokes, even in business environments, as that was believed to be his way of coping with stress, no matter how major or insignificant. In the interim five years, he had earned himself a solid reputation in the crypto community, particularly in British Columbia, where he had become one of the region's most relied upon voices in Bitcoin. Jerry was known to enjoy the finer things in life, and loved the activities that he was able to enjoy with the advent of cryptocurrency. He was now able to do stuff that he would not be able to afford otherwise, and the entire world had been opened up to him. Along with his wife, Jennifer, Jerry had become an avid traveler, visiting dozens of countries over a two or three year period. He also began flying airplanes, buying his own brand new Cessna 400, valued at around half a million dollars. In 2018, he even began working towards a helicopter license, but seemed to have begun to lose interest in flying throughout the year. Jerry also owned a boat, a 51 year old yacht called the Gulliver but it is not believed that he sailed much, if at all. To many, it seems like Jerry enjoyed the possibility of these activities more than the activities themselves, and Quadriga allowed him to pay for all of these investments in his personal life. A man named Eric Schletz, who had gotten to know Jerry through a Nova Scotia flying club, said about the Quadriga founder, quote, The guy had more money than he knew what to do with. I've seen Jerry walk through an airport with $50,000 in cash. That's the scale of money the guy had. He was a very reasonable person, but if he was going to spend the money, he was going to buy something nice. However, in addition to the glitz and the glamour that came with his newfound wealth, Jerry had also been struggling with Crohn's disease behind the scenes. He had been diagnosed with the disorder when he was 24 years old, right around the same time he founded Quadriga, and the affliction required thousands of dollars worth of medications each month to stay up on. In November of 2018, Jerry and his new wife, Jennifer, prepared to take a trip to India. The trip, which was billed as equal parts honeymoon and humanitarian trip, was built around the couple visiting an orphanage they had helped fund in the preceding months. However, they made sure to plan stops around tourist attractions like the Taj Mahal, and seemed prepared for a lengthy stay, building an itinerary that would last at least a couple of weeks. Before they left though, Gerald Cotton made sure to refresh and sign his will, despite him being incredibly young and relatively healthy. Perhaps he was just overly prepared for the worst case scenario, but he left most of his assets to his new wife, Jennifer, naming her the trustee to his entire estate, an estate that included an airplane, a sailboat, a couple of pricey vehicles, and a handful of real estate holdings in British Columbia and Nova Scotia. This will was so exhaustive that it even set aside $100,000 for a trust fund to take care of the couple's two chihuahuas, 
Nitro and Gully in case of their untimely deaths. Just days after signing and filing this will, Jerry Cotton and his wife Jennifer Robertson set off for India. Gerald Cotton and Jennifer Robertson arrived in New Delhi, India on November 30th, 2018. There, they planned to begin celebrating their honeymoon, while also participate in the opening of an Angel House orphanage they had sponsored. The couple had been in India for a little over a week when trouble began to strike. They had arrived in Jaipur, India on December 8th and planned to spend four nights in the city. They were staying at one of the nicest resorts in all of India, where they checked in at around 6.10 p.m. local time. Shortly thereafter, Jerry began to feel unwell. A doctor from the hotel saw him and attempted to treat him, but cautioned the couple that he could not do much. That evening, 30-year-old Gerald was rushed to the Fortis Escorts Hospital. It seemed like he was suffering a major setback in his fight against Crohn's disease, and upon his admittance, was diagnosed with septic shock, perforation, and intestinal obstruction. He was in an incredible amount of pain and discomfort, and was struggling with both repeated vomiting and diarrhea. Surprisingly, his vitals seemed to be good. Both his blood pressure and his pulse were normal. He was given some antibiotics and allowed to stay in a private room overnight, but sometime during the next day, his situation began to take a turn for the worse. Dr. Jayant Sharma, one of the doctors treating him, stated that Jerry, quote, became restless and developed respiratory stress as well. We shifted him to the intensive care unit immediately. There, Jerry continued to rapidly deteriorate. Within just a couple of hours, he had fallen into cardiac arrest, and the hospital worked to stabilize him over the next few hours. On December 9th, 2018, at around 7.26 p.m., Gerald Cotton passed away at the age of 30. His cause of death was listed as sudden cardiac arrest stemming from a perforation, and blood tests revealed elevated levels of white blood cells, indicating sepsis. Over the next couple of days, Jerry's widow, Jennifer Robertson received a death certificate from the local municipality, as well as a no-objection certificate from the local police, which allowed her to transport Jerry's remains back to Canada for burial. These were both necessary steps, which also involved an additional step in oversight to ensure that no foul play was involved in the death. It has been rumored online that Gerald Cotton's remains were cremated in India but I have found no official confirmation of that fact, so take it with a huge grain of salt. On December 12th, 2018, three days after Gerald's death, his widow Jennifer filed an official affidavit on behalf of Quadriga, which included a statement of death for Jerry. The affidavit stated that Quadriga had roughly 363,000 registered users and owed approximately $250 million in both cryptocurrency and cash to approximately 150,000 of those affected users. Unfortunately, it seemed like virtually all of the company's funds and assets were held in cold storage, making them inaccessible until further notice. So, before I move forward in the story, I'm going to take just a tiny step back. At this point, you may be wondering what exactly cold storage is. Well, even though I'm not the most well-versed in cryptocurrency jargon, let me attempt to explain it. When it comes to cryptocurrency, there are two types of storage, hot wallet and cold wallet. Cryptocurrency runs off of a series of checks and balances to ensure that things like bitcoins are not just copied, what we know as double spending, where the same online token can be spent two or more times over. Transactions are documented on a blockchain, which is really just a never-ending log that documents every single move or transaction, ensuring that this coin is here and that coin is there. Does that make sense just a little bit? Think of the blockchain as a large spreadsheet that everyone has access to, where you can see who has what. Everything is kept anonymous, of course, but you can verify the existence of each and every piece of cryptocurrency. 
such as Bitcoin, a Litecoin, etc. Instead of bank accounts, cryptocurrency are held in addresses, which are in essence a folder of your choosing. This is where hot and cold wallets come into play. If you were to keep your bitcoins, for example, in a hot wallet, you would keep it in a bitcoin address, which is connected to the internet at all times. This is bitcoin that you can use at any given moment to pay for something, send to a friend of yours, etc. You could go online and actively monitor the existence of this bitcoin, and make sure that it had not moved or gone anywhere. Think of a hot wallet as a bank account, which you could check online, move money around, deposit or withdraw, etc. Or, in this example, when it comes to Quadriga, think of a hot wallet as a cash register. It's easily accessible, but it's also more easily accessible to others. More often than not, whenever cryptocurrency is stolen, it is stolen through hot wallets. Because of this risk, some choose to keep their crypto in cold storage. Using the same example as last time, Bitcoin. In this case, you would keep your Bitcoin in a cold wallet, which could be any kind of storage whether it be a hard drive, a thumb drive, etc. Anything like that. You can move your cryptocurrency there temporarily to ensure its security, as it would feasibly only be accessible by you. As in, this storage device would not be connected to the internet, and is held behind both a physical and password-protected firewall. Cryptocurrency held in cold storage is not accessible by anyone through the internet, thus making it far more secure. However, there are a different set of drawbacks to cold storage, which may include losing access to the cold storage device, accidentally damaging it, etc. There are a number of modern-day horror stories of people losing untold riches held on cold storage, including a man who lost millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin on a hard drive he threw away years ago. So, in essence, if we're using the metaphor of a hot wallet being a cash register, think of a cold wallet as a safe, or a safety deposit box. It's money that only you have access to, and nobody else can access it through digital methods. But, there is the drawback that if you lose the key, you also lose all of your access to anything that's inside. Well, now that that's out of the way, at the time of Gerald Cotton's untimely death, the Quadriga hot wallets only had around 682,000 in US dollars worth of cryptocurrency on them. However, on the flip side, it was estimated that more than 130 million dollars in cryptocurrency was now missing, or at the very least, held in some of Quadriga's cold storage accounts. Following the death of its CEO and founder, Quadriga CX continued running as if nothing had changed. The exchange would continue to accept deposits for more than a month without telling anyone that the company's boss had passed away while visiting India. For weeks, customers were unable to obtain money from the exchange, leading to concerns that the company was running low on cash, or perhaps was becoming insolvent. Behind the scenes, Gerald's widow, Jennifer Robertson, had assembled what remained of the board of directors upon her return to Canada to try and figure out a path forward. She had been named the trustee of Gerald's estate, so it was her responsibility to try and settle whatever matters he had at Quadriga. That was when it became crystal clear that the company was virtually just Jerry and whatever work he had done on his laptop. None of the other directors or shareholders had been involved with the company since 2016, and other than a few contractors that had been hired by Gerald to perform tasks here or there, there were no real employees. Jennifer tried to figure out how to access the company's funds to pay out clients and customers, but other than the less than $1 million held in the company's hot wallets and approximately $70 million in cash, there was no way to pay out everyone. Jennifer claims that she attempted to access Gerald's devices in the hopes of locating a cold wallet with more of the company's assets, but would be unsuccessful. In an affidavit, she claims that she even hired a hacker to try and do the same, but Likewise, those efforts were fruitless. On January 14th, 2019, more than a month after Gerald's death, an announcement was finally made on Quadriga's website and social media pages. The announcement was made by Gerald's widow, Jennifer Robertson, and explained how the CEO had passed away while doing some charity work over in India. As you can imagine, this raised a number of issues among not only Quadriga's clients, who had hundreds, thousands, or even millions of dollars invested in cryptocurrency through the exchange, 
but among authorities who began poking around in the company's public records. Despite this announcement, Quadriga CX continued to accept deposits for the next two or so weeks, until January 26th, meaning that there was still money coming into the company, but very little, if anything, being paid out. Shortly thereafter, on January 28th, the website was put into maintenance mode. As worried customers began wondering what was next for the largest crypto exchange in all of Canada, on January 31st, 2019, the announcement was made that Quadrica had filed for creditor protection, which is just a step or two away from declaring outright bankruptcy. This meant that the company did not have a solid plan to move forward and pay out the money it owed, but would open up the company's records for an outside agency to come in and look over the books. Gerald's widow, Jennifer Robertson, claimed in her court filing that the company did not have the money necessary to pay out its customers. In a sworn statement, Robertson claimed that most of the company's assets were held in cold storage wallets that only her deceased husband would have had access to. However, she also claimed that the 2018 issue with the CIBC, which had resulted in more than $25 million in Quadriga assets being frozen, had impacted the company's bottom line. Quote, the litigation with CIBC had a significant impact on Quadriga's ability to operate and to ensure users of the Quadriga platform were kept whole. Jerry told me that he was advancing his own personal funds to ensure that payments were being made to Quadriga users. Robertson also claimed that whatever money Quadriga held in cold storage was out of her grasp, having been held behind a firewall that she did not have the necessary passwords to acquire. Quote, the laptop computer from which Jerry carried out the company's business is encrypted, and I do not know the password or recovery key. Despite repeated and diligent searches, I have not been able to find them written down anywhere. On February 5th, 2019, Ernst & Young, a large multinational company, was appointed as the independent monitor for Quadriga. Quadriga had been granted temporary legal protection from creditors under the Company's Creditors Arrangement Act, which is a form of bankruptcy. Ernst & Young were tasked with going through the company's records from top to bottom and determining what assets Quadriga owned slash possessed and figuring out a way to get them back into the proper hands. Prior to the company's appointment as Quadriga's independent monitor, it had been revealed that Quadriga did not have a bank account or a formal accounting system of any kind. Rather, it had been relying upon third-party payment processors, which juggled around the confusing finances. It was also reported that Quadriga had been run entirely from CEO Gerald Cotton's encrypted laptop from his home in Nova Scotia. Despite customers in both British Columbia and Toronto believing that he was a local, interested parties began going through Gerald's numerous devices, including two active laptops, two older laptops, two active cell phones, two older cell phones, and a handful of fully encrypted USB keys. They were searching for any sign of a cold wallet storage system, and actually were able to find several such devices belonging to either Quadriga or CEO Gerald Cotton. Unfortunately, all of these wallets were empty, none of them having contained cryptocurrency since April of 2018. At least one other cold wallet, quote, appears to have been used to receive Bitcoin from another cryptocurrency exchange account and subsequently transfer Bitcoin to the Quadriga hot wallet on December 3rd. It is believed that at least three more cold wallets belonging to Quadriga were found in these subsequent searches, but like the prior examples, all of them were empty. Whatever money Gerald Cotton had turned into cryptocurrency, there was very little trace of it in the records he left behind. In a pre-filing report, Ernst & Young claimed, quote, With Mr. Cotton's passing, Quadriga did not have the proper governance to manage the business. Now, we're going to pause for just a moment to hear a word from today's sponsors. Following the death of Gerald Cotton, and his company Quadriga filing for creditor protection, 
several of his former customers and clients found themselves left in the cold. Elvis Kvalik, a Calgary man, was one of Quadriga's many hundreds of thousands of customers. He had used Quadriga to stockpile Bitcoin in the years prior, having made the decision to hold on to them for the time being. When the time came for him to withdraw the cash value of his cryptocurrency, roughly $15,000 worth, he only realized after the fact that he was never going to get them out of the crypto exchange he had trusted since 2016. Kavalik had put in his withdrawal request in November of 2018, and would not find out until January 2019 that CEO Gerald Cotton had passed away, who had seemingly taken with him the cold wallet reserves needed to pay out all of his customers. Thankfully, Kavalik had only invested five or six hundred dollars worth of his own money in crypto, but there were several others that were left much worse off than him. Zitong Zhou was another user of Quadriga, who had moved from the US to Canada over the last couple of years. When he moved, instead of putting his money into an actual bank or money exchange, where they would have a number of fees associated with the transfer, he decided to put his life savings into the Quadriga cryptocurrency exchange. Zhou had put roughly 420,000 US dollars of his own money into Quadriga as well as a couple of large bank loans he had invested in cryptocurrencies through the exchange, for a total of more than half a million dollars. When the time came to withdraw his money, however, he was told repeatedly by Quadriga that due to their ongoing issues with the CIBC, which had frozen roughly $28 million in Quadriga assets, that he would just have to wait. Well, months later, the news broke that Quadriga CEO Gerald Cotton was dead. Shortly thereafter, Zitong Zhou took to YouTube to explain what, exactly, had led him to lose more than $500,000 in Quadriga. Hey guys, how's it going? Um, so I just want to give an update uh, about my situation right now. Uh, some of you may have heard on the news or read on an article um, something about me, uh, which doesn't happen very often, but uh, in this case, um, yeah, I guess uh, if you looked at Coindesk or Cointelegraph, uh, Bloomberg, if you're in the crypto uh, industry and you've been checking the news, um, you might have heard my name actually been thrown about um, because recently this Canadian uh, crypto exchange company called Katriga CX uh, is filing for creditor protection, which means basically they're one step away from bankruptcy. And uh, I kind of got caught up in it, uh, unfortunately. Um, and yeah, I pretty much ended up uh, losing my life savings because of it. And uh, it's really kind of a crazy story how it happened. So to tell it from my point of view, um, so I've been having really bad luck in crypto uh, and kind of started last year. Um, and a lot of this is due to me, I, I guess, me, bad timing, bad luck, everything put together. Um, I was... So... What happened was uh, in 2017, in December 2017, January 2018, uh, there was this kind of crypto boom uh, that happened. A lot of people got really uh, made a lot of money from crypto, including a lot of my friends. And uh, I got, you know, as humans often do, we get we get greedy and we get selfish. And I was jealous of my friends for making so much money. So um, I kind of took a big risk. I actually took out three loans from the bank. And I put it all in crypto, which is really, really stupid. But uh, at the time, you know, I was really, really emotional. And um, you don't think straight when you're emotional. So uh, that's what happened. I ended up putting all my money into crypto, which uh, that was January, the end of January 2018, uh, which, as you know, um, crypto crashed. The price of Bitcoin dropped from around... 16,000 uh, at that time to now it's around like 3,500 or something like that. But it wasn't just Bitcoin. No, I didn't put my money into Bitcoin. I put my money into something that dropped even more, which was altcoins. So I put my money into uh, Ethereum, uh, Ripple, that dropped a lot, uh, Cardano, uh, all these altcoins that dropped even more. Uh, NEO is another one that dropped a lot. Um, ICX, like I put all my money into these coins that dropped like a massive amount. I'm talking like 95% now. Um, so I'm pretty much down like 95, 95%. And uh, since I took out three loans, um, I was pretty much paying it all back with my paycheck every month. And um, that 
uh, wasn't a good situation. That was basically over half my paycheck every month was going to pay off, pay off those loans and uh, the other half was going to my mortgage. So I had basically no money um, to really save last year. So I had to make the decision to sell my apartment in San Francisco, right? So a lot of people read this article and they, th they, they thought, well, how could this guy have so much money? Um, you know, some people have sympathy for me. Other people got really angry at me. Other people said, oh, this guy's an idiot. This guy's stupid for putting, you know, his life savings into this um, crypto exchange, uh, this Ponzi scheme. And uh, other, yeah, so some people had sympathy. Some people didn't. Some people calling me an idiot. Some people got angry at me. Um, so I bet I've dealt with all this online. You know, there's a lot of internet uh, people in the community um, talking about it and I've read some of it. Um, some of it's pretty harsh, but some of it is true, I think. Uh, and yeah, I mean, so first of all, I, I want to address some issues here. So some questions people ask, how did I get so much money in the first place? Well, I lived in Silicon Valley for seven years in San Francisco. Um, and I wouldn't say that I'm a huge saver. I, I spend a lot of money, but most of that, those savings came from my apartment, which I bought in 2013 with the help of my parents and I sold it uh, last year to pay down those loans that I took out for crypto um, and by then the house price had risen like 40% so I gained um, a bunch of money from that so that's why I had uh, $400,000 saved up right I wasn't really saving it was basically my for my apartment and the loans uh, I put into crypto took out already $150,000 for my savings. So it was last year I lost $150,000 of my own money and on top of that I lost $400,000 from this Katruga CX scam. So this, it's a total of like uh, $550,000 gone, right? Which is a lot of money and, and you know, uh, some people online got angry at me and they're like, how could you know this guy who is so stupid and so foolish to put all his money in in such a scam you know uh how could how could he have so much money and how could i have not so much money and uh some people got bitter and really angry at me for that and to those people i say well you know i might not be the most financially savvy person i might have have taken a lot more risk i might have been reckless but if you guys think you're financially better like smarter than i am then you can do that too. Go ahead, go to San Francisco, make as much money as I did. It's not that hard. Uh, you can find a job there as a software engineer pretty easily. Um, invest in stocks, you know, buy an apartment, and you can just, you know, and, and if you're financially more savvy than, than me, then obviously you can save as, at least as much money as I did, right? So to those people who are angry at me, I don't know why they're angry at me for, because if they think they're financially, have better financial sense than I do, then they could easily save up just as much money as me, right? Um, and you could say that I got lucky because I bought my apartment at the right time and sold at the right time, but obviously I didn't get lucky because I put my money into the wrong thing, right? And you might have said, though, that's foolishness. You're an idiot for putting your money into this crypto scheme, Ponzi scheme thing. The belief that Quadriga CX is a Ponzi scheme of sorts is only a rumor slash allegation at this time but is a major theory that has been spread over the last couple of months as this story unfolds in real time. In case you're unaware of what exactly a Ponzi scheme is, it's a pyramid scheme where someone uses money obtained today to pay out prior investments. A lot of times, Ponzi schemes are run by people who borrow money from investors with the promise of a good return, but only ever pay out former investors with the new investor's money. It's a fraudulent tactic often used to lure in more and more investors, and perpetuate a scheme until it reaches the point of no return. When it comes to Quadriga CX, the belief that it might have been some sort of illicit Ponzi scheme is based on analysis performed by people familiar with cryptocurrency blockchains, which again are the big open ledgers that all crypto transactions are documented on. Blockchain analysts have looked for evidence of there being any hidden money in any of the accounts owned by either Quadriga or its CEO, Gerald Cotton, and have been unable to find any record of the missing amounts. This has led to the belief that, if the cold storage wallets ever did exist, they have likely been laundered several times over. It is possible that Quadriga CX was using current and future investments in their exchange to cover past debts which explains why the company seemingly had very little in the way of cash reserves, or any kind of financial backup. At least, nothing to the tune of $250 million. 
which was expected to be needed to pay out the rest of their users. It's also possible that this is why Quadriga continued to accept deposits and process orders well into January of 2019, more than a month after the death of CEO Gerald Cotton, even when many of the customers that tried to withdraw their cash or cryptocurrency were told that they could not. James Edwards, a cryptocurrency analyst, publishes his research on a blog titled Zero Nonsense. After the Quadriga story broke, he spent some time digging through all of Quadriga's known accounts and wallets, tracing each visible transaction over a period of months. In February, he posted a brief summary of his findings, which follows. 1. It appears that there are no identifiable cold wallet reserves for Quadriga CX. 2. It appears that Quadriga CX was using deposits from their customers to pay other customers once they requested their withdrawal. 3. It does not appear that Quadriga CX has lost access to their Bitcoin holdings. 4. It appears the number of Bitcoins in Quadriga CX's possession are substantially less than what was reported in Jennifer Robertson's affidavit, submitted to the Canadian courts on January 31, 2019. 5. At least some of the delays in delivering crypto withdrawals to customers were due to the fact that Quadriga CX simply did not have the funds on hand at the time. In some cases, Quadriga CX was forced to wait for enough customer deposits to be made on the exchange before processing crypto withdrawal requests by their customers. 6. After completing the analysis, it is the author's opinion that Quadriga CX has not been truthful with regards to their inability to access the funds needed to honor customer withdrawal request. In fact, it is almost impossible to believe that this is the case in lieu of the empirical evidence provided by the blockchain. James Edwards spoke to journalists with the Wall Street Journal and expanded upon several of his points. Quote, None of the withdrawal addresses provided by customers led to a wallet that could be considered anything comparable to a reserve wallet. The largest wallet that Edwards could find was the Quadriga CX Hot Wallet, which had less than $1 million in cryptocurrency value attached to it. The others had substantially less, and were only tied to customer addresses and other Quadriga addresses of equal or lesser value. Nothing matched with the roughly $130 million in missing cryptocurrency that was estimated by Jerry's widow, Jennifer Robertson, in her Quadriga creditor protection paperwork. James Edwards actually believes that Quadriga had been liquidating its assets for the better part of a year, since 2017 or so perhaps siphoning value from its numerous accounts during that span. Surprisingly, he is joined by a number of other cryptocurrency experts, who believe that Quadriga CX was likely using future investments to pay out past debts, a business tactic commonly identified as a Ponzi scheme. Taylor Monahan, the founder and CEO of MyCrypto, a digital wallet service, tweeted out the three main business wallet addresses for Quadriga. She pointed out that there seemed to be no evidence of Quadriga having any cold or reserve wallets for those addresses, and that by most calculations, Quadriga was simply running on borrowed time. Jesse Powell, the CEO of Kraken, another crypto exchange, tweeted out that his company knew of thousands of addresses linked to Quadriga in the past, none of which seemed to be linked to cold wallets or other reserve addresses. He even hinted at this being linked to borderline criminal activity, welcoming any communication from law enforcement for his cooperation. Max Gelka, the CEO of Elementus, an analytics firm, stated in an interview with CBC News, quote, So you know when looking on the blockchain to see whether what's there corroborates the story, you would expect to see funds moving out into a cold wallet. The fact that no cold wallets are present means that, yeah, it's not consistent with what they're saying. In the months since news of Quadriga CX founder Gerald Cotton's death, Jennifer Robertson, his widow, has become the target of numerous online attacks and conspiracy theories. People involved in Quadriga and the overarching crypto market believe that she is or was involved in some kind of scheme concocted by Cotton and or herself. A scheme that is undoubtedly enticing, but primarily based on guesswork inspired by what little is known about Robertson herself. Online theorists have spent the past few months digging up information about Robertson and dragging it into a public spotlight. 
It was discovered that between May of 2016 and October of 2018, Robertson, along with Jerry, had purchased 16 properties in Nova Scotia. These properties ranged in value from $94,000 to $2.5 million, and 12 of these properties were held by Robertson's company, Robertson Nova Property Management LTD, a company that she is the president, secretary, and sole director for. When Jerry died, Robertson also inherited other real estate holdings from his will, valued at more than $7.5 million. Following his death, she quickly moved to remove his name from all real estate holdings, moving them into separate trusts controlled wholly by herself, likely an attempt to protect them from future creditors coming after Quadriga's assets. It was also discovered that Jennifer Robertson had not been born Jennifer Robertson. She had been named Jennifer Forgeron in 2016, when she began buying up these properties alongside Jerry and seems to have changed her name to Jennifer Griffith at some point in the interim three years, before finally settling on Jennifer Robertson. It is unknown why she has changed her name, but that has not stopped online theorists from speculating. Despite Jennifer Robertson claiming that she had no involvement in Quadriga CX prior to her husband's death, insisting that Gerald ran the company all by himself, and their personal relationship did not impede upon his work, that claim has been disputed by many of Quadriga's own customers. These customers claim that they have received money transfers from Robertson in the years prior to Jerry's death, going as far back as 2016 and 2017. Some of these customers have even provided deposit slips with inquisitive journalists, which show Robertson's company, Robertson Nova Property Management LTD, as the company making these deposits to Quadriga customers. This would blur the line between what Jennifer had filed in official affidavits concerning her involvement in Quadriga and what Quadriga customers allege is the truth. There are a number of other theories concerning Robertson which I will not address, since a few seem to rely upon misogynistic insults and other troubling themes. However, Robertson remains a key component in the story of Quadriga, and I think her story is worth sharing. Despite acting as the trustee for Gerald's estate, she continues to remain out of the public eye as intense scrutiny surrounds everyone involved in his or his company's orbit. Jennifer Robertson continues to search for the cold wallet funds, which she hopes remain in Gerald's belongings, but she has not had any success in finding any of them, yet. In addition to the belief that Quadriga CX might have become a Ponzi scheme over time, some on live believe that it might have been conceived as an exit scam of sorts. An exit scam is a con where an established business continues receiving payments for new orders while stopping shipment of past or present orders. Because of the company's reputation, the scam is allowed to proceed for days, if not weeks or even months, before anyone starts to pick up on the scam itself. Exit scams are likely already familiar to anyone in the Bitcoin or crypto community, as the admins of the online black market Evolution made off with close to $12 million in customers' Bitcoins back in 2015. They had continued receiving customer orders for some time before the scam became public knowledge, but by then, the damage had been done. Some believe that Gerald Cotton had been planning a similar exit scam for months. In the time period leading up to his death, he had been unable or unwilling to pay out many of Quadriga's customers. Then, he had updated his will just days before his death, and traveled to a part of the world where faking his death would be easier, or at least would require authorities to jump through several more hoops to discover the truth. By the time that anyone knew what happened, he could have had at least a month to get a head start on a new life with perhaps tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in assets in his possession. At least, that's the crux of this theory. Many who believe that Quadriga CX was some kind of exit scam reason that Gerald Cotton seemed to have been overly cautious when it came to his personal life, making sure to update his will just days before his death, and itemizing everything, including $100,000 set aside for his pet chihuahuas. On the flip side, it seems like he was incredibly reckless with his business assets, leaving behind no financial statements as well as having no record for more than $100 million in crypto. The two different versions of Gerald Cotton, 
One incredibly well prepared, and the other seemingly lackadaisical, seem to stand in direct opposition to one another. Of course, if we carry on this idea that Quadriga CX was an exit scam of sorts, then we get into the next step of this convoluted conspiracy theory. The theory that Gerald Cotton had somehow managed to fake his death while absconding with millions of dollars. Which, while enticing, seems to stretch the limits of believability. Right? When Gerald Cotton died, he had been in the city of Jaipur, India. A known tourist destination, but an area that is also known for all kinds of medical malpractices and frauds. Online theorists have pointed to dozens of insurance scams tied to Indian officials, who received payouts in order to fake documentation, sometimes even providing fake death certificates for the right price. Author Elizabeth Greenwood even published a book about these seedy dark markets, which are found predominantly in the Philippines and India. Her book, titled Playing Dead, A Journey Through the World of Death Fraud, details how exactly people in the 21st century are able to hire doctors, administrators, and witnesses to fake their death for as little as $100. When we dive into the grimy details of Gerald's death, this theory starts to make more and more sense. He died of Crohn's disease, a disease that has a 3% risk of death with proper treatment, which, by all accounts, Gerald had. He was spending thousands of dollars each month on proper medication, and his Crohn's disease, while a prevalent issue, did not seem to cause him any serious setbacks in his life prior to this trip in India. He had also updated his will just 12 days before his death, which, while not nefarious in any way, is certainly suspicious especially for a relatively healthy 30-year-old. After Gerald's death in India, his body was handled by staff at the hotel he stayed at, instead of the local embalmer, who had actually refused to receive the body due to an issue with local officials over the specifics. There also seemed to exist discrepancies between the death certificates obtained by different journalistic entities, as different organizations seem to have received certificates with different times and addresses pertaining to Gerald's death. While minor, these issues seem to plague the overarching story of the Quadriga founder's mysterious death, and cloud how, exactly, he passed away. Following his death, Gerald's remains were flown from India to Canada, and it is unknown if anyone in Canada actually observed his remains. Based on the foreign death certificate, it is possible that a simple statement of death was issued, and his remains were forwarded to a funeral home where a closed casket ceremony took place for friends and family. From there, it is believed that his remains were cremated, although I cannot find any official confirmation of that. Nonetheless, the circumstances of Gerald's death remain a point of contention for the thousands of Quadriga customers that lost money through his crypto exchange. Online theorists continue to highlight every perceived flaw in the official narrative, and are quick to jump on any gaps in the story including the actions of Gerald's widow, Jennifer Robertson, as well as the likelihood of Gerald dying mysteriously while visiting overseas. There continues to exist no real evidence of Gerald Cotton having faked his own death, despite the insistence of many in the crypto community. It's primarily a theory pushed by users on platforms such as Reddit and Twitter, and is perhaps a theory that is more intriguing than it is possible. While I do think anything is possible, I personally believe that the odds of him having been able to orchestrate this entire ordeal are infinitesimal at best. As skeptics and online theorists continued to poke around in the history of Quadriga, they found another enticing lead which came in the form of co-founder Michael Patron. I've only brought up Patron's name twice in this episode, right at the very beginning. He was involved in the founding of Quadriga along with Gerald Cotton back in 2013, but did not seem to be actively involved in the company. In fact, he has claimed that he left the company back in 2016, following a dispute with Cotton over whether or not to take Quadriga public. When interested parties began looking into those involved with Quadriga, they soon stumbled upon the shady history of Gerald Cotton's founding partner, whose history seems to be just as shady as Gerald's mysterious ending. In fact, it is widely believed that this individual was born under a different name, and only changed it to distance himself from prior legal trouble. Michael Patron had actually been born as Omar Danani. In 2003, upon entering adulthood, it seems like the young man named Omar Danani had changed his name to Omar Patron. 
This is because he was involved with the website Shadow Crew, which was involved in all kinds of hacking attempts and trafficked in stolen credit card numbers and identities. In 2004, the then 20-year-old Omar Danani slash Omar Patron was arrested by the U.S. Secret Service for operating an anonymous electronic money laundering service, eventually pleading guilty to burglary and grand theft charges. And the following year, 2005, was sentenced to 18 months in prison. His mugshot can still be found online, listed alongside his birth name, Omar Danani, as well as his alias, Omar Patron. Following his release from prison in May of 2007, he was deported back to his nation of birth, Canada. The next year, 2008, he seems to have fully leaned into his alias, legally changing his name to Michael Patron. He did not really pop up on the grid again until 2013, when he co-founded Quadriga alongside Gerald Cotton. He served on the company's board of directors for around two and a half years, until he left the company following a dispute with Gerald over the decision to list on the Canadian Securities Exchange. However, he remained one of Quadriga's main shareholders, and stayed in relatively good terms with Jerry afterwards. The two actually last communicated with one another via text in November of 2018, shortly before Gerald was flying to India. In the months since this story is broke, Many involved in the crypto community have begun digging into Patron's past, and discovered not only his prior criminal conviction, but his two name changes. They also found a number of Reddit accounts linked to him, in which he discusses cryptocurrencies and other digital ventures he's involved in. Patron has continued to deny any assertion that he is, or was rather, the figures known as Omar Danani or Omar Patron. Even when faced with composite images showing the near-identical appearance of the two men and himself, and the documented proof of his name changes, he continues to assert that he was only ever known as Michael Patron. Patron continues to claim that he has not been actively involved with Quadriga since 2016, despite owning a majority stake in the company. He also denies any knowledge regarding Quadriga's missing funds, and asserts that he did not know anything about Gerald Cotton's trip to India or the inner workings of Quadriga, really, until after Jerry's death in December of 2018. Quadriga seems to have been a company that was run entirely by its founder and CEO, Gerald Cotton. At least, that's how it appears from the outside looking in. A company that only Jerry knew the inner workings of, which was run entirely in his laptop and his mind. He seems to be the only one that knew where the bodies are buried, so to speak. So trying to determine what kind of assets Quadriga had, without him being here, seems almost impossible. More than $150 million in customer funds remains missing, closing in on half a year since Gerald's death. The amount is likely closer to $190 million in US dollars, if certain estimates are to be believed. Many of the alleged accounts belonging to Quadriga remain inaccessible to government regulators, commercial interest, possible creditors, and even Jerry's loved ones, who are forced to try and clean up the mess that his untimely death has left behind. It is believed that this unknown amount, valued at approximately $190 million, had been turned into cryptocurrency that has not been found in any hot or cold wallet reserves linked to Quadriga. It is basically gone, existing in the ether between solid and liquid currency, where not even cryptocurrency experts are able to determine what happened to it. None of the addresses linked to Jerry or Quadriga seem to provide any answers, which is sadly exactly what the blockchain is meant to provide. The fact that Quadriga can't find any possible addresses where these millions upon millions of dollars might be indicates that the money isn't where it's supposed to be, or it possibly never existed at all. It seems to be just as possible that Jerry left behind a hidden hard drive with thousands of crypto tokens. As it is that Quadriga CX was a colossal scheme, which used future investments to pay out past customers. Quadriga customers are still owed upwards of 250 million in Canadian dollars, which is owed in both crypto and fiat currencies. It is believed that the remaining assets will be used to do so, but the customers that relied upon Quadriga's cryptocurrency exchange will receive far less than they paid in. Quadriga is still being investigated by multiple parties 
Not only the aforementioned firm Ernst & Young, who were appointed as the company's independent monitor back in February, but by law enforcement agencies such as the FBI and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. In addition, Jesse Powell, the CEO of US-based Kraken, another crypto exchange, has offered up a $100,000 reward for any, quote, tips that best lead to the discovery of the missing funds. Powell wants to bring some credibility back to the cryptocurrency market and believes that Gerald Cotton, on behalf of Quadriga, had moved his cryptocurrency around through other exchanges. Until a full analysis is complete, it will be impossible to tell, but for all intents and purposes, the money lost by Quadriga seems to have been lost for good, at least for now. More hearings for Quadriga's future are scheduled for later this month, April of 2019, in which we will undoubtedly learn more about where these missing assets might have gone. We'll also learn more about the company's creditor protection process, and whether or not Quadriga will be forced to declare bankruptcy. With any luck, those that lost money through the exchange will be able to file a lawsuit and recoup at least some of their losses in the near future. In the months since this story began unfolding, many have pointed to the story of Quadriga as a worst-case example of the volatile market of cryptocurrency. Many continue to believe that the market needs some kind of legislation or organization, perhaps even a government entity regulating the sale and distribution of cryptos, which, of course, others disagree with, saying that doing so would eliminate the essence of cryptocurrencies, which were devised as an impartial third party devoid of any governmental oversight. Nonetheless, the dispute continues, and many believe that the tragic fall of Quadriga might be the impetus needed for major reform. Until further notice, the story of Quadriga remains unresolved. Thank you for listening to this episode of Unresolved. I know that the subject matter is a bit different than my usual fare, but this is a story that I've been following for a few months now, and I've just found it so fascinating. I mean, how often does a hundred million dollars just disappear? Shit's crazy, yo. If you'd like to keep in touch with me or the podcast, shoot me an email at michael at unresolved.me. That's M-I-C-H-E-A-L at unresolved.me or find the Unresolved social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, and or Instagram. I have not been super active lately, I've got a bunch of life shit keeping me busy these days, but I hope to have some more free time in the near future. If you want to find a transcript of this episode or any other information, check out the podcast website at unresolved.me. Each episode has a slew of sources you could check out, a list of the music used, etc. At the top of the page, you'll also find a link to the podcast store, as well as the podcast Patreon page. I always hate asking for your guys and gals support, but honestly, any support you can give is greatly appreciated. Even though I've been doing this for three and a half years now, the podcast is still a one-man show, as I do all of the research, writing, recording, editing, etc. on my own. I've even learned how to use Photoshop a little bit. I mean, I love doing it, but it takes up a lot of time and I'd love to keep focusing on the show full time. Your Patreon dollars are greatly appreciated, as my wife and I have been faced with some unexpected expenses recently, and are looking down the barrel of another cross-country move because of her job. So I'd like to give a special thank you to everyone that's helped support the show through Patreon, and I always try and make it worth your while with bonus episodes, and even a brand new podcast, Resolved, which is all about solved cases and stuff like that. The next Resolved episode, which is dropping on the 15th of this month, is a story that I've wanted to cover on this show for a while, but I was never able to figure out an angle, so it's shaping up to be something special. Anyhow, before I go, I just want to say thank you to all of you for continuing to listen to Unresolved. Words cannot express how grateful I am to have such an amazing audience, and I'm a super lucky dude to have so many awesome fans. Thank you. With that being said, hopefully the pollen down here in Georgia will continue to fuck off, and I could bring you another episode next weekend. Until then everyone, stay safe, and I will talk to you later. Cheers. <laughs>